Welcome to the Flyers Nitty Gritty Podcast. Getting giddy with it with your host, Yuri Wallach. And my partner in crime is not here tonight, but I have a replacement tonight, Chris Marr. How you doing, buddy? What's up, guys? What's up, Yuri? How are you? Doing well, buddy. Thanks for joining. And our guest um, from Sportsology, I believe it's your site as well, Russ? Yeah, it is. Yeah. So Russ Cohen from Sportsology, uh, I'm a fan. I've been uh, listening to your work. At least I've been li- tuning in on Eklund's podcast, The Hockey Buzz, pretty regularly all these years. I've read you online, uh, on Twitter, and just everything. And obviously we bumped into each other uh, over the past couple of years. Oh, for sure. And I just love your opinion, man. I love your opinion on scout on, um, on players. I think you have a pretty... Um, pretty non-biased opinion on a lot of players i think you're also forgiving with a lot of them being kids and i and i thoroughly appreciate that a lot of times in your yeah i i appreciate that i mean that that probably goes back to my hockey prospect radio days because we did the show for so long i want to say it was 15 years that we had a chance to see what players would prove you wrong what players would develop six seven years later and you know those kinds of things and when you learn and live that then you realize okay yeah you know you should this is history that you could learn from so we i tried to do that i love that yeah we talk about that all the time actually we just had uh, curtis gabriel on uh, on a previous episode and we were talking about just the growth mindset mm-hmm. and i talk about that with athletes they're never gonna stop they're not gonna just sit there and be like oh i guess i failed this year they're gonna keep pushing and pushing every year so right. it's tough to bet against these personalities oh yeah i mean that's the yeah the, and curtis is a good guy and I bought his shirt, right. an ally shirt, and I wear it on the show because I believe in the cause. I'm wearing a human rights campaign one right now. We, uh, I've done work with them. I've gone to the Pride Parade last year, and like probably four. Actually, we went to like three last year. So, um, yeah, so I'm on board with all that. But I get why athletes are athletes too, and and how they push through things. And you know, I've been interviewing athletes for years, so I I do sort of understand the mentality a lot of times. Well, that's. And that's awesome, and I think that reflects in a lot of the stuff I've seen over the years. So, well, I'm excited to get into this. Um, we actually have some hockey news for the first time in a long time, and it's actually pretty fantastic. Um, I guess we'll start off with the Flyers news, and I think we'll start off with the bad news, and I think that way we can just kind of roll into the good stuff from there. But obviously, the roster came out, and well, I guess the good news of that is that all the big names are there. The Flyers didn't have anybody opt out, at least. Um, anybody that hasn't played or isn't injured of some sort, right? So the whole slew of rosters are there. The Black Aces are there, and we'll talk about them. Well, but they do have one injured player on the roster. Oh, which one? I'm sorry. Shane Gostasphere with the knee injury, with the knee surgery. Yeah. Oh, actually, yeah, I wanted to bring that up, right, because we're going to go into the lines. I, From what I understand, he's, like, injured but not completely injured, mm. but he probably was injured this whole time type of scenario. Um, we'll, we'll get into that. It's a good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but for sure. So let's, let's talk about Nolan Patrick for a second. So we'll get that one out of the way. I think a lot of people were trying to be optimistic. I was definitely trying to be optimistic. I wasn't necessarily thinking that the playoffs were going to be the time for him to come back. Um, I was still always thinking kind of next year in the future from here on out and that it's not the end of his career, but it might be, you know, a significant amount of time. And that's kind of where I stand today the unfortunate news um, you know, that he's not here. Uh, I think that was kind of the, maybe the plan all along. Maybe they were, had some tentative optimism, but Russ, I'll open up to you first. And then Chris, uh, what do you, what do you think about, uh, Nolan Patrick not being at, at the, uh, at camp and for the playoffs? Yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised. I really wasn't expecting him to be there. I know people wanted to be optimistic, but you know, the most we saw out of him was he was in practice. He wasn't doing any traveling. He wasn't taking any hits. And so even that quote that we got through Chuck Fletcher that said, hey, this is the best I felt in 12 months. Yeah, but you haven't been hit yet either. And we don't know if that's going to trigger, you know, another migraine down the line. I, I know people who have migraine issues. And it, it's, even in this day, it's hard to get them under control and be predictable with them. So they did the right thing for now. I'm not even going to say I know definitively that he'll be there and ready to start and ready to go next year. He'll try. Uh, but it all depends again, then next year you'll find out what happens when he starts making contact and if that, what that will do to, you know, his situation. Cause yes, it's not post concussion or anything, but still could affect it. So I'm still 50, 50 on, you know, when he'll play, I'm sure he will again. It's just, you don't know when. And so like, I'm, I'm not even going to 
say he's a definite for next year. I'm just saying it's good that they're not trying to say, hey, let's have you make this team this year because he would try and it probably would be too soon. So they're making the smart decision here. Yeah, I think that's a pretty smart answer. Chris, Chris, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I like to be honest, I mean, I feel like it's just like we didn't hear anything on him for months on end. And it was like, you know, from, you know, and, and it, Rush, just like you said, it was, you know, he's practicing, he's practicing, he's practicing. And then you don't really hear anything from when the whole season stopped till now. And, you know, that you know, they, they, they the Flyers said he was in Manitoba. So it's like, you know, it, it just didn't really make sense for him to be on the team. Um, and, and you know, me and me and Yuri, if we talked about this earlier off, uh, off the, the call, um, how, you know, for them, I guess you could say they're saving a roster spot because they don't want to chance it. Um, and it's like if he can't play or if something happens where, you know, something happens last minute where he's not able to be in the lineup, then they they save that roster spot instead of, mm-hmm. you know, you know, they, they have another guy to put in there. So, you know, I definitely think it's good. I just made a video about this right before we, we hopped on here. Um, so, you know, I, I, I agree with it. I think it's the smart move. Um, I think it's best just to wait and see what happens with him and take it as little, you know, t- take it, like, just play it smart. Just like take it month by month and see what happens from here. It, you know, it's, it's actually a really good point. Even just from a, a risk standpoint, right? Risk, risk mitigation, right? You have your roster. Let's say he does come. Let's say he even plays well at, at training camp. Maybe he outplays some guys and then he has a setback and all of a sudden you picked him and then maybe some guys get sick. And all of a sudden now you're down numbers. I feel like everybody kind of counts. And I feel like in this case, you know, it was there's just no room for risk in this one. That's why I think I agree with you, right? Next season is the time where that's that's on him, right? He has plenty of time to fight back and go into camp. Yeah, because again, what if that roster spot came down to him or Morgan Frost? I mean, Frost is 100% healthy. Will he get a lot of time? Maybe not, but he might. And, you know, at that point, you know what you have in him right this moment where with Patrick, you're going to be wondering, and yeah, this is, in this kind of situation, you don't want to have a dead roster spot if you can help it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Just remove that risk. And I, I think that goes to our line combination. So what I've seen so far, um, and I can't pull them up to share them at the time, but uh, top line, we got Giroux, Coots, uh, Voracek, second line, Faraby, Hayes, Konechny, JVR, Lawton, Abe Kubel, the third, fourth, Raffle, Grant, and Pitlick. Uh, defensive pairings, Provrov Niskanen, uh, Dusanhai Myers, and Haig Braun. I think they're interchangeable there as the two and three. Um, and then you have Hart, Elliott, and then there are extra goalies, Lyon and Ustamenko at the moment. Uh, Thompson is an extra is injured, uh, as Ross likes to say. So I want to I want to get into that. So Chris, I'll let you go first this time. What do you think about the line combinations going into this, and then Russ? I mean, I, I honestly, I, I, I honestly liked them. I think it was just, you know, they tried to put out the best thing possible. Um, I, I honestly liked the Farabee Hayes connecting line. I thought that line had good chemistry throughout the whole season. I honestly think you can put Lawton, uh, you know, switch Lawton with Farabee as well. I think that line had a lot of chemistry. We talked about that before. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, your whole your standard Jeruk Sherry of Warcheck. That's a great line. Um, I really liked that fourth line. Who did you say that was? That was Grant, uh, Rafael, and Pitlick. No, the fourth line is Raffle, Grant, and Pitlick. Okay, yeah, yeah, I, I like that one too. Um, and honestly, I think it's like there's a lot of skill down there on that fourth line that kind of like opens it up a little bit. Where they have, you know, it, like it's sometimes it seems like this team has four first lines at at sometimes, like with, with the way that they play. <laughs> so it's kind of just like I liked all the lines. As for the defensive pairs, I liked them. I think they were solid. Those are the ones that they played with for majority of the season. The, you know, those were the ones that. Really, we're kind of the the shutdown uh, lines from there. And uh, Russ, if you want to go off of that, yeah, I mean, I I think you could pick on most teams their pairs. I, I like Hag; he's actually had a really good bounce back year. Braun to me wasn't that great, but he's a veteran. You're not going to play him probably more than 15 minutes, so you could live with it. Uh, I think that's fine. The line combinations I think could change at some point. I uh, I think it's fine to give Farabee that chance because now maybe with him coming back, having lived through a part of an NHL season, maybe he could start playing like the Farabee that was not on the Flyers because the one that was on the Flyers were surviving for a lot this year. It wasn't the Joel Farabee that was pushing offense, taking shots, 
having a load of confidence. He had confidence at certain points in games, and he certainly had confidence on defense, but he was surviving for a while. So, you know, now you might get to see a little bit more of him, so maybe that that line spot is just. I I think at some point, though, uh, if for whatever reason the bottom six sputters, you could see Frost go in there maybe on the wing. I, you know, think if at some point they start having trouble on faceoffs, you might see Thompson pop in there. So they do have some depth, and, and that's going to go a long way for them. I still think their third pairing is going to be a little a little shaky at times because the the foot speed on the third pairing is not great. Even even with Robert Hogg, it's not great. And so depending on who they're playing, I don't think it's going to be a big deal. But I think if you're going to start you know nitpicking about stuff, that's the first place I'd look. Fair, fair enough. And I, I think I think that's fair, and especially the, the Hague braun combination. Not a lot of dynamic play from there. Nobody's no. really going to be taking big shots or maybe setting up breakout point passes. But I think that's well, – we'll go into him in a second, but I think that's where Ghost is kind of severely missed. Um, yes. Or maybe they change up the pairings with Sanheim and Myers, right? Um, they had good success, but they're both more puck movers than either one of Braun mm-hmm. and Haig. Um, as far as the forwards, I completely agree with you, Ross. I totally think the lines will change. I think that top line will probably stay, yeah. um, but Hayes is interchangeable with some forwards there. Um, I do think Frost is going to play. I, I, I think you're absolutely right. They're going to need speed. Um, he's got a lot of it. Whether he's going to be on yeah. the wing or center, we don't know what happened over the past four months. I think about that quite a bit because that's usually an off season. Now they missed out on a lot of opportunity as well to train and normal cycles. But I don't know about growth just among you know kids essentially, right? Like twenty year old, twenty one year olds. Four months is a lot of time, at least physically development. So maybe maybe Frost will be ready, more ready than we we thought. Just like Faraby, which I also agree with that. What what do you think about somebody like Frost, maybe coming in and being ready for the third line position? I think he could play third line. I don't know if Vigneault is going to let a young prospect take defensive draws on the third line in a playoff game. I doubt it. So right. that's why I said wing, or if he's playing center, they're going to have somebody else there who could take draws on the wing when it's crunch time. And I think that's fine. I mean, Grant, there are, yeah, and it could be Grant. And because I do think at times, the Flyers do need more speed because, you know, let's face it, even Claude Giroux, after a good 20 seconds or so, when he gets that head of speed, he gives up the puck. Like he he basically has to stop in the offensive zone at some times because he just doesn't have the wheels, especially if it's towards the end of a shift. So it would be good to have somebody like Frost, another really fast guy that could cause problems for the other team. I think AV will look at that. I don't know if he'll use him right away. He's going to have to impress him in camp. But that's something where that's a little – that's a good weapon to have. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with that assessment. Well, Chris, what do you think? About Frost? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I personally think he can play, like, anywhere in the lineup. I think you can put him in center. You can put him in wing. I think he's played really good all over the lineup. Um, I mean, obviously, in the stints he had, I thought he had good chemistry with all the guys. Um mm-hmm. Personally, I I, I I don't know what your what your opinion is on this, but I would like to see him on the power play, maybe second unit. Um, I would definitely like to see him on that because I think when he was on it, I think he has some really you know creative plays, and I think we saw a little bit of that with him. He made some real creative play this season. I think that would help them on the power play at some points. Um, and I you know I I definitely think that maybe if you throw him in a position where it's like. I, it's kind of it's it's a little hard to explain. It's it's a little, little difficult. You, I guess you'd have to watch like to understand what I'm saying. But kind of like a, a position where he doesn't necessarily need like the the greatest like offensive partners with him to succeed. He can kind of just run with everybody, and the, the whole line just plays good as a whole. Where it, like if you look at that on paper, it's not like the the biggest uh, like eye popping line like w- w- name wise. But I think if you throw him with guys like Albie Kubel or, or maybe Pitlick, um, you know, m- 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 possibly with like a JVR or something like that. I think that would be a nice line to see too and, and see him kind of develop and, and kind of take it up uh, as his own there and kind of move from there and see where he goes. Yeah, I like that. Well, that's why I mentioned Grant because I think Grant can compensate. He's, mm-hmm. very, he's very good defensively. He can take draws. He's big yeah. and strong. Yeah. 
And JVR is, I don't want to say a liability defensively, because I don't really see him as a liability, but he's not a penalty killer, right? He's nah. not that guy that you're going to rely on in that last minute. I mean, I wouldn't say he's a detriment, but again, I think you'd have to mix it up a little bit with Frost. So let's move on real quick. I do want to talk about Ghost. Um, and Russ, I'm going to go to you first on this one. So Ghost uh, apparently has been injured this whole time. And I think there's obviously hints to that. You know, the, the drop-off in play is a highly talented player, and you don't see him behaving in a dynamic style you see a more hesitant player and really with ghost is he's never going to be your shutdown guy so if he's hesitant and not pushing the pace um kind of like eric carlson who's also not amazing defensively but um kind of learned that as he got older it's like he constantly needs to convert defense into offense and if he can't do that he's just not going to be an excellent player in the league he's a replaceable bottom pairing guy right he's not physical enough so what do you think about ghost over the, the past few months in his current situation yeah, I we knew he had the one knee surgery, and we saw that probably wasn't all there mentally, like trusting it, trusting Vin, Vigneault's system. And so mentally, he was a mess at times, even with the puck in the offensive zone, even just trying to get a shot on goal. He was missing so many shots. Now we find out it's the other knee, you know, and he tried to play it down. Hey, it's not a tendon or anything. It's just a quick scope, whatever, but I'm not where I want to be, and I haven't skated a lot. And it's like you worry about how that's – been rehabbed and so I don't think we're going to see him start the playoffs because I don't think he's going to be able to get in good enough shape by the time he gets there they'll certainly play him in that preseason in the first game because Fletcher basically said yeah it's an important game but I'm going to play a lot of the other guys so and, and that's fine I think you should because I do think you do you don't want guys to get hurt um, but I think they're going to test him out and if he doesn't seem to pass the test I think we could see him out of the lineup for a while. And that's just, you know, the risk right now with him. I didn't know it happened. Uh, you know, and then I saw later on in the quotes, he was talking about how, you know, the push off. All those things are really important for his game because we know he's not great defensively. And this year probably took a step back. He was doing better last year at the end. And now he probably took a step back with that. But if he's not going to add that offensive punch on the on the third pairing, then you're better off not having him there. Yeah, and then you worry about his confidence over time right. as well. Right? Yeah. Chris, go ahead, man. Yeah, definitely. And and I and I honestly think the biggest thing about that was his confidence. Like his confidence has been shot since the trade rumors uh coming on from last season. Um I've I've brought this up many times. When they did the behind the glass, uh, you know, that like preview of the training camp, the four episodes, he talked about that. He talked yeah. about the trade rumors when he was interviewed and stuff. Um, and I was just like, dude, this is going to be the exact same thing for this season. And it, it was just, I, it was kind of obvious to me, like that he just could not get it out of his head. I think that's the biggest thing because I think he has a lot of skill where it's like, 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 it, like to me, it's like, what guy do you see go from missing? Mi like he, he missed games for a while and then comes back versus Boston and, and he's on the second power play unit. It's like that, that, that shows you right there that they have the confidence in him and he has the skill. Um, it's just he doesn't have the confidence really in himself right now. And I think that once that comes, um, I think he, he will definitely be a solid player. Now, obviously, you want to play it smart with him as well. Um, and I would rather have Hag in the lineup instead of him. I, as you said, Russ, I agree. Um, I think Hag has played better than him this season. I think Hag also took a step up. Um, so if, if anything, I would definitely wait with Ghost. Um, I wouldn't really try to just put him in the lineup to put him in the lineup. I try to work him in. If, if they're going to, I try to work him in and see what happens. But personally, I would rather have Hag instead of Ghost. Yeah, I don't think he's going to be like Andy Delmore these playoffs. I just don't. Yeah. I don't know if he gets that reference, but uh, I don't, yeah, Andy no, Delmore. I have no Look idea. it up. Look it up. Look it up. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, actually, I heard um, Wyatt Kalanuck, actually, maybe we'll talk about that in a minute, but I heard his success potentially could be like a Andy Delmore type of player. Who just I think a little the... better, actually. I, I, that's what my assumption was also. Yeah. Sorry, he, go ahead. No, it's okay. He's better defensively. Delmore wasn't much defensively, but right. back then, though, he did have a really good shot and was a good skater. Kaliniak has all that, but he's really a master on the power play. Now, I get I get that the Flyers are jammed up right now, right? So if he wanted to play right away, it would be hard. I think where the misstep may have been was Fletcher sort of went for the easier defenseman to sign first, so he went for Hogberg, and when he did that, he never could get over the the hump for Kalinia because then all of a sudden he looks at it and says, well, now you just signed Hogberg. Now my chances are even, even lessened. And I think that was maybe, maybe he should have waited on that. Cause I think he could always could have signed Hogberg. And, and I think 
he should have tried to work it out with Wyatt because even though, the, like I said, even though today the power play looks stacked and we can name all kinds of guys for it, you never know what's going to happen three, four years down the line, and that's a guy who can run a power play. Now, he's going to do it in Chicago. I don't I know. know if he'll do it right away, but he might do second pair right away because Duncan Keith's not really good on the power play anymore. He's not. And if you look at it, he's they don't even they weren't even using him at times on the power play. So they got a gift. And I'm not going to kill the Flyers for it because I do think they're a victim of their system right now. But, you know, we'll see well, what happens down the line with that. Well, if you think about Kevin Hayes, that was didn't he do didn't he leave on Chicago, I believe, to New York? Right. So, you yeah. know, you win some, you lose some. Yeah. Hopefully, Kalinick is not as good as you say. He's though pretty I, good. Though He's I'm not going to lie, everything I've seen from him, I actually really liked him as well. Now, I, I'm still pretty high on some other guys. Like I really like Ronnie Attard as well. Yeah. I, don't know, I don't know if he's going to have the same ceiling, but I think we have enough guys, at least, that we won't be crying about him. No, but Attard is more of a long-term project. The thing, yeah. of, thing about why it is, um, if you remember when Justin Schultz got in the league, Edmonton sort of misused him, so his offense didn't really come through right away, and and that was a mess, right? The minute he went to Pittsburgh, though, and they let his offense work, so that's the thing. Chicago is going to let him be offensive. Now, you know, they do have other guys there, too, and so we'll see. Adam Boquist could be in his way, too. So, you know, he might have to wait a year or so to get on the power play. We'll see. Yeah, yeah. I guess never-ending names here, right, uh, to compete with in an over, overseas. Hockey's so, unbelievable, man. If you want to talk I, about a sport that has young players, great young players, and has had that influx for about 10 years or more, it's this sport. And and I'm lucky because I'm a prospect guy, so luckily it's worked out that way. I mean, years ago, I tell the story, we started in 01, and we're at the, I'm at the draft, and somebody goes up to us, and, and me and Shane Malloy, who was, I was doing the show with at the time. But I, at that time, we, I wasn't doing the show with him. I actually just did a live podcast from the draft out in the lobby, and nobody else was even doing that, right? So we, we had fun with that. But, you know, they, they went up to us and said, hey, you know, what do you guys do? And, and I'm, you know, we're like, we're both like, we're like, hey, we, we write about prospects. And this writer was a known writer, and he's like, why? Why are you doing that? Nobody cares. And that it's was, you know, weird. possibly true back then. And, you know, and it took a few years. And now everybody cares, right? Especially in the cap world and especially now with a flat cap for maybe a couple of years. Uh, people are going to care even more. So I, that part we kind of got lucky with. But luckily we were too stupid to walk away. Yeah. I mean, USA Hockey is in a great position in general, though, to grow the sport as well, right? Yeah. I mean, if you just think about the names that are up and coming, and I know you're yeah. a big fan of even the Hughes brothers, but just yeah. not not just them. Just look at the U.S. program where we got Faraby, Cam York from. And the third Hughes brother will be around next year. There you go. And it's just, it's not <laughs> nonstop now. Back in the day, though, there's always been a lot of talent, but it's, it's almost like it's on steroids. It's just everything's in overdrive. There's so many more good hockey players than ever. It's the Euros um, that sure. helped, right? It's the influx of Euros. That's That's been a big thing. Yes, USA Hockey has been churning out players, but if you look at the amount of players that come in now from the DEL, like, you know, how many players used to come in German. from the DEL? That's that's a big deal now. Um, but also, you know, the SHL is pumping out a lot more. The Finnish Elite League, even the Czech Elite League now, we get guys. We get more Young players from the KHL now, which never used to happen, right? Now, like two, you know, you have two guys in the draft this year that have both at least seen KHL time and like Pod Coles in last year. So right. it's all that all makes the system robust, man. Yeah, no, no, no. those are great points. Um, I do want to go, so I want to get actually into prospects. Uh, I do want to talk about Friedman, though. Mark Friedman mm -hmm. just got his extension, uh, I believe it's two years at One seven way. and a half. So yeah, 725. one way. 725, thank you. I was just pulling it up. 725, uh, it looks like he makes less on bonuses, but more on, obviously, his average salary, but obviously a one way, so he's going to get paid. Um, mm -hmm. Good for Mark Friedman. Obviously, I think he's a great player uh, for what he is. He's NCAA prospect, was a, a good college hockey player, um, and it looks like he's going to be a really good, at very least, AHL defenseman. I think he is a top pairing guy in the AHL, and I think he is creeping his way into a consistent bottom pairing, and maybe even like a number four one day. 
Um, but I really like his game. He's slightly undersized, but I think we've talked about it, Chris. He reminds me of kind of a poor man's uh, teaming in. Uh, in some kind of way, he has a you know that same kind of grit for a smaller guy, the two-way game. Uh, Chris, why don't you go first on this one? What do you think about the Friedman signing? Yeah, I mean, I I personally love Friedman. He's been one of my favorite prospects for a couple of years, um, and I and I think and I think one of the reasons I love him is because he reminds me a lot of Niskin, and and not so much the way he plays, but just the way that he goes out there and he doesn't need to be told what to do. He just does it. Like I, I feel like Friedman's been like that for a few years now. Um, I, I personally thought he played good in the six games he played for the Flyers this season. Um, he could, could have played his seventh uh, that game versus Tampa. He was called up and then sent back down like an hour before the game. Um, but, you know, I, I, I like the signing. I think it's good. And, you know, it, and Russ, you, you brought it up earlier, just like how, uh, you know, they're, they, they basically just like they have a good problem right now. And it's they have too much depth. And that, that's like the best problem they could have. Um, so really, it's good for them because. You know, it's a solid defenseman that they can throw in, and it's like injury-wise, something like that. Freeman can come in and play. We saw that happen a couple of times. So I like the signing. I think he's a good defenseman, um, and I think he'll definitely uh, pan out into something. Um, I could definitely see him being a top four as well. Your I do agree with that as well. So I could give you. I'm sure this one tournament I was at, somebody from the Flyers had to be there too. So I'm going back to on my website from 2013. This was from the Atlantic Challenge. It was the USHL, and I was up in Hackensack, New Jersey, right? And this was the first thing I ever had a chance to cover USHL-wise because they never really come east. Now, the last few years, they've been having their tournaments in Pittsburgh, and that's been great, and I've been going every year. But first guy that I noticed that jumped off was Ivan Provorov. Ivan Provorov, I wrote about him. I said, hey, this guy was the best player on the ice, and I gave this glowing um, recommendation on him. And he, he was playing for Cedar Rapids at the time. The g- a guy playing for Waterloo, though, Mark Friedman. And here's what I wrote about him. And I honestly think some of these things have come true. Uh, solid skating offensive defenseman had a great shot. He had a scoring chance. He had he did have a top-shelf goal in the power play. He's never going to see that. Can really move the puck around with a man advantage. That was what he was able to do then. And now he has definitely turned it into good skater, toughness. Still has a little bit of offense. If you need him to make a play, he can make a play. And, you know, this goes back to 2013. And so I'm happy to see that at least I saw something in Friedman that has him continuing to move up the ladder. And, again, defensemen, a lot of times it takes five years. Five, six years is normal for defensemen. Provov is the exception, you know, and Sanheim is the exception. So that's nice. I also think they did this because they know they can't re-sign Justin Braun or unless he's coming back ridiculously cheap, which I don't think he'll do. So this, you do have to have other guys that you could plug in either knowingly on the, on the third pair or in case of injury, you can call them up. So I think this was a good, smart move to do that, and it's a little foreshadowing too. But again, I like Friedman. I, I spoke to Dave Isaac early in the year. We both were agreeing that, hey, he should get a shot at really making this team. And, you know, it didn't work out, and then he at least got some playing time. And now, you know, maybe he'll get some more playing time if there's an injury. Who knows? Yeah, they got a lot of competition. That's kind yeah. of the the problem. Um, but also, it's a, it's not really a problem, right? It's it's you always say you start off, oh, how do, what do we do with all these players? And then by the end of the year, you're searching for a player. <laughs> right. You know, it seems to happen every single season, um, cause just because of injuries, right? And, and whatever can go wrong. So <clears throat> I totally agree with what you guys are saying. I actually very much like Friedman, um, but I think there are other players that we want to talk about. There are other players within the system. Um, doesn't necessarily have to be with Lehigh Valley, but Russ, I'm going to open this up to you first, um, cause I really want to hear your opinion. Do you think anybody within the Flyers prospect system is kind of on their way to a breakout, whether it be NCAA Phantoms and there's a long list and I can pull up names if you, you want, but Jay O'Brien, mm-hmm. um, uh, wow, if they're escaping me off the top of my head right I'm now. I'm a little but, worried about O'Brien though. I think he's going to be on a longer track perfect. since he went back to the BCHL and I know, He's going to get back into college hockey. But if there's going to be college hockey, if not, that could really screw with his development because his 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 development was not set. So not sure. Bobby Brink had a really good year. The only thing I worry about Bobby Brink is small in stature, and he, he did have an injury. He, his points per game is great. but and, and I got to see him, and I did get to see him this year at a game in London, and he looked really good. He looked really good on the power play. He was playing good defense. His teammates love him. So actually – no, Brink is uh, not on defense. Who am I thinking of on defense for that? Mm. Uh, York? 
Mm -mm. Zabola? Huh? Zabola? No, uh, Mil Mason Millman. No, Mil no, no, Millman. Okay. He, okay. Yeah, my brain was morphing into Millman. But to finish okay. out with Brink, yeah, he was with Denver, did really well. I like his skating, and when he plays with better players, he skates really well and, and can make better plays. So I do think, look, I don't think he's dynamic like Cole Caulfield, but I, you know, I think he's going to be a really good NHLer, and I think he is probably ahead of schedule. Mason Millman really had a good year this year, and, and Cole Perfetti, who's going to go high in this draft, spoke a uh, blue streak about him, and, and I did get to see him in a game where he did score a goal. He was, for a while, mainly playing that power play specialist role, but then later in the game, they were giving him more uh, defensive assignments, too, and he was doing well with that, and that's something that Perfetti, uh, you know, Christopher Saginaw, told me that he felt like he was doing with, and, and he's a really smart kid. So, you know, Millman could be one of those guys that could be ahead of schedule, and just because of where they're at with defensemen, they don't have to rush this guy, but he really does have a lot of offense. And so, you know, he had 44 points, 13 goals. Like, that's that's a really solid year. And, you know, we're talking about him being 18 years old. So I do think he's a guy that maybe doesn't get talked about every day in their system that is doing really well. Yeah, and again, I think that's what you were talking about, the injury, right? He started off a really slow in the yeah. year and then exploded in the second half from what I yeah. recall. Yeah. Yes. For sure. Um, I do want to ask you two quick, and then and then I'm going to go to Chris. Uh, and York's guys... an obvious. York's a terrific player, but I still need. He needs to be in college another year. He probably needs the AHL for a year. He has to build up his body. You don't want him to come up too soon because he has all the other gifts. But if you come up and, he, and you let him come up before he's physically developed, you could have a problem where he gets injured, and I wouldn't want to do that. He's young for his age group, right? Yeah, because yeah, yeah. he's like Hughes as well. And you can see that's catching up with Hughes. And, yeah. that, and that's what I was saying. Even six months at that age can be a big deal at 17. But he's not going to be Quinn Hughes. Let's not go there. He's not. Like Quinn Hughes is a cut above. Like Quinn Hughes, yeah. I got an article from, I, see that. I want to say it's three years ago where I wrote after seeing him in a game that he was a generational talent. And that was before the draft. And, and I know people were iffy on him after, you know, his first year in Michigan. They were like, eh. and, you know, it, there's a development curve. There's a development curve with everybody. But you saw this year, I actually think Quinn Hughes changed the game. I think the way he plays, skating up the ice, making decisions on the fly, doing it seamlessly the way he does, he made Vancouver so much better. And I really do think defensemen are learning from him. And I don't think York's at that point. York, York's a super great skater. But I don't think he has the brain that Quinn Hughes has. That's I think that's pretty. Well, I was actually comparing Jack Hughes. Oh, Jack. Okay. Because of the age group, but oh, I, love, okay. I love what you said anyway. So I didn't want to interrupt <laughs> you because I thought Sorry, it was great. Sorry, I jumped the gun on that. No, no, no. It's okay because I mean I totally agree with what you said, and I think Quinn Hughes is a special player. Um, Chris, I'll let you open up real quick, and then I have two more players I want to uh, bring up. What do you What do you think about the players you mentioned? Uh, B B Brink, I wanted to go off, um, and because I really liked him at the World Juniors, I thought he was fabulous. Um, I thought he played really good for USA, and everything that Russ said that he played good in, he did exactly the same thing for USA. I believe he had five points uh, in the seven games played. I think it was two goals, three assists. Off the if my if my memory serves me right, uh, but I think he was he was very solid in those games. I thought. When I saw him, I believe it was 2018 Flyers development camp. He was like wasn't noticeable at all, and that it was just like a complete turnaround. I thought he was fabulous in the World Juniors. Um, as for Millman, I don't really know too much about Millman. I definitely will uh, check him out now that now Russ that you brought that up, um, and I know you're you you and Jamie have talked about him before, but um, I'm really excited for these prospects. This is good. this is going to be a fun time. Yeah, I think with Zamula with with the World Juniors, I think they had Romanoff on the on the top pair on the uh, top power play and Zamula on the second and then Zamula had the two goal game and yeah. then they realized uh oh Zamula <laughs> may be actually a little better than Romanoff right at this moment in time offensively yeah. and all of a sudden Zamula got a lot more power play time and was doing great on the power play yeah he, I, I remember writing about him for another website not for mine and and I was like really pleasantly surprised same thing as you you know you said in camp he was okay but he definitely took a step and that was a, a big deal for him yeah, he was fabulous at the World Juniors. I thought he was phenomenal. And I think another thing was, too, was, you know, the power play was good, but I think how he was, his poise game was, like, unreal. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, yeah. he could wait so long and still make the play. I was, I was, I was like, dude, like, how, like I, I was just so amazed. Like, how does yeah, that even happen? Yeah, he was playing really good. And that was noticeable 
from day one when he showed up at training camp. That's what stuck out to me. Yeah. I remember watching him in the games, and he's skinny as a stick. He's got, like, literally, I'm like, who is this kid? I didn't even know his name. And every single time he touched the puck, clear breakout pass right on the stick, just no pressure, no hesitation, didn't even look phased by NHL play. And I never even heard of the kid, and he was undrafted. Um, Russ, actually, real quick, what do you think about him in comparison to Phil Meyer's track, right? Because it's kind of similar, right? Players under the radar, they're both big players. They both have an offensive game, explode the next year. I think the the only difference is I don't think Zamula has the same kind of frame to put on the same kind of strength that Myers did, and that really took him to another level. Uh, I could tell you that a year ago we had gotten like this long interview with with Phil and um, Philippe, and it was me and uh, Jason Martinez. We were doing a stick to hockey, and we were talking to him. And while we were talking to him, he was still working out. He was still doing the hand thing, and he was still and 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 I'm telling you and. And I got out of that interview and I, and I told Jason, I said, he is so physically developed now compared to like when he snuck into camp and they did put up Phil Myers and I'm thinking, who's this guy? Is he like an American player? And then I remember I called someone and I'm like, oh, Philippe, they're really pulling a fast one here. And the next day they signed him. And that was really smart by the Hextall crew because that really went on almost unnoticed. But I remember seeing the, the name plate up there because I am one of those jerks that covers rookie camp every day almost. And so that was a really great move, but he still had to do, you know, all the work and he has done all the work. The only thing you worry about with him is he does tend to get injured. So he might be one of those guys that like you never see all of it, but even if you get 80% of it, it's really good. And I don't think Zamula will be on that level, but I think, you know, I want to say he's a, a little lesser, but which is still really good. I mean, I think Myers, you know, they've got a second pairing guy, and I don't know. I think Zamula could get there, uh, but he's going to have to do some work too. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a fair assessment. I think Zamula, maybe his patience might come into play there yeah. versus Myers, who's very aggressive and got himself yeah. into trouble this year, which I think is really what hurt him this year. Yeah. That's pretty much it. It was just his overaggression. I think even AV said it publicly, if I remember correctly. But AV, yeah. you know, the thing about AV, and, and this is where, you know, covering a lot of Ranger games and stuff, or at least watching a lot of it and, and going on air and analyzing it a little bit with Sirius. I know a lot about AV. I knew a lot about AV before he became the Flyers coach. And I tried to tell people that a, I thought he would get Kevin Hayes and I thought Hayes would be really good, even though that wasn't a popular opinion. And I got, I remember that I got sort of killed on that and, and was getting killed even until like the end of the season. Everybody was like, Oh, we sort of get it. But but AV also, I think, was taking the knock that he couldn't develop younger players. But I had pointed out that he did. But the thing about AV is if you're a fast defenseman that can hold on to the puck and also hit some guys, AV is going to love you. And and so that's the thing. He he loves that kind of player in Myers. And so he's willing to put up with some of those things for Myers, knowing that there's better stuff coming and it's hard to cover Myers when he you know when he's on. And so that's the thing. And he right now he's just a secondary guy right after, you know, Provorov and Sanheim and even Niskanen at times still shows a little bit of offense. So right now he's just like an extra weapon. But it, over time, you'll see, I think A.B. will really start to utilize him. You know, workhorse. That's the way I kind of yeah. see him. Yeah, like I, yeah. kind of what Colton Pareko. And I don't think they're the same type of player, but I do see him. Defensive element. I just, we got this big brooding guy who can skate and kind yeah. of own the ice. It's really hard yeah. to find those guys. I think they were hoping that Sam Moran would be that guy on some level, at least defensively. And I honestly, never, yeah. I never thought he would. I, you know, we all love Sam as a guy. He's a great guy. Um, I didn't love the pick. I'll be honest, but I always give prospects a chance and always gave him a chance. And I saw that he was fast as a straight line guy. He always mm-hmm. had trouble switching sides, though. Then he got a little better at that. Then he started getting injured, and then it was like I, I got to see about a year ago where I was thinking, I'm not sure if this is really ever going to really happen for him. You know, I might get a couple games here and there, but I just don't think it, it was going to happen for Sam. But that's the way it is sometimes. That's fair. That's fair. So uh, two players real quick. Um, Wade Allison and Tanner Lezinski. Now, Wade Allison didn't play a ton. Uh, Tanner Lezinski had a great season. Wade Allison finally kind of made his way back in. Um, I want to hear 
opportunities maybe for next year or where they are at today? Chris, I'll let you open up first with that one, and then we'll go to Russ. Yeah, I, uh, I honestly, I, I feel like both of them can definitely be like first line phantoms for next season. Um, I personally love Allison. I think he's a great player. Has an unbelievable shot. I, I, you read, I don't know if you saw the, the video the other day. Um, he posted a video on Insta on his Instagram story, and he was ripping them uh, from the corner. It was unreal. Um, I'm very excited for him. It sucks with all the injuries and stuff, um, but I'm happy that he can definitely. I, I feel like if Frost does not make the team uh, next season, if, you know, whenever that is and things like that, um, and if it's obviously like a normal training camp, um, I think if he doesn't make the season, I think he'd be really good with Frost on that first pair with down in Lehigh Valley. I think there are two players that kind of bode well with each other. I think they can play well together. Um, and I'd definitely be really excited to see that as well. Yeah, I could see that happening. I, the thing about Allison is, I was, I'm still a little worried when he came into, um, into rookie camp or was it training camp? I think it was still rookie camp. Um, mm-hmm. I was talking about how his knee was still hurting him from the season mm-hmm. before and probably is still hurting him now. I don't think it's still a hundred percent and he had a really good year, but I still don't think he's a hundred percent. If that knee ever gets settled for him, I think he could be a really good player because I do think he can be a net front presence and he is a big, tough kid and he's a decent enough skater. I mean, certainly with his knee now, you're not going to get all of that out of him. But I do think the Flyers don't have a lot of guys like him that are willing to go to the net. And I think he can do that. So if he could just sort of get that knee in check, I, I'll be very excited because the kid like will do anything for you. He'll go through a wall. He's a very engaging guy. And and, and guys love him in the locker room. So I, I really do have hopes for him. I do. And and who was the other player? Sorry. Lozinski. Yeah, Tanner Lozinski. So... Tanner Lisinski, I was pleasantly surprised when he did sign because I thought there was a very good chance that he might not because he had a lot of suitors. I think after all the pandemic stuff or whatever, I think I think that sort of settled in and maybe they decided to just go with whatever opportunities they had. And I think now you could see where if he if he is a fir- if he's starting in the Phantoms, he'll be a first line center for the Phantoms. He he's physical. He wins faceoffs. He drives offense in the sense that he possesses the puck he's got a good shot he's not a superstar in any way but he's a guy that will continuously put on points he is good with puck possession and he is strong he's strong for his age so could i see if he wowed everybody in camp maybe he got a 4c spot with the flyers it's possible but if it's not this year you know this next year 2020 21 it would be the year after so i think he's close I really do, and I think a little bit of AHL time would be good for him, but he is a kid that's really determined and really was a leader on Ohio State, and actually in that last year there, that was a lousy team, and his numbers were still pretty good, but the year before when they were really good and I was covering them up in Lehigh Valley, they were tremendous, and he was a big reason that they were like that, and you could see he, you know, at the college level, he was starting to dominate on the ice on a lot of shifts, especially in the playoffs. And to me, that was a really good sign. And I know there was a lot of back and forth. He played wing, he played center. He really can do either. And they really did kind of use him both ways in his career. But I think if you're going to start him at Lehigh, let him play center and see what he can do at center. Because if he can't be a center, then that's fine. You just turn, you know, let him play the wing. But he he could definitely do both. Yeah, I, th- I think that's a really fair assessment. I always saw him as kind of like a Mike Richards type of guy. I, mean, I don't want to say the same level of skill, yeah, but yeah. a guy who can kind of do it all, kind of looks like a men's hockey league uh, skater in a way. Mm-hmm. Like He's not the flashiest guy, but he can really mm-hmm. get up and down the ice. He can kind of do everything. I mean, Herman Roots uh, reminds me of a Russian. Uh, again, I don't want to be too stereotypical here, but he's got a smoother stride and mm-hmm. more of a playmaker attitude. But that's also that same type of player. Um, and he was a captain, any ch- he was a leader, so you know I could see where you would at least say, hey, there's a little bit of a reminding of, of Richard. Yeah. He, he's got leadership abilities, and, and he definitely would, would – I think he would elevate the Phantoms a bit. I do, because I think he's very uh, – you know, just he's – I don't want to say he's aggressive. I just, he's very competitive. That's what Perfect. I would say. Yeah, that's the, right, that's the right word there. All right, so let's, let's move on a little bit. I want to go to the NHL draft. Um now, this year, I think it's going to be a little different for the draft. Uh, lots of games were missed. Lots of information was lost. Uh, Ross, I'm sure somebody who covers prospects uh, for a living and just in general for all these years, you've missed out on games yourself. However, I'm sure your opinions won't sway completely. 
Um, but I do think there's going to be a little bit of uh, abnormality with the rankings and the expectations of where players go. And I think this is an opportunity to get some steals, if you will, uh, just because games have been kind of lost here at the end. Uh, maybe you're a little tighter, some players than others. Uh, Russell, I'll let you go first on this one. Um, what about this year's draft? Do you think the Flyers have a chance to move up? Do you think there's anybody in particular they should try to go for in their range? Um, or anybody you're just interested in general? Yeah, I basically what I would say is after speaking to a lot of people, a lot of teams probably had about 85 to 90 percent of their work in. Um, there is still an opportunity to see some guys like at the end of the month, I may be at uh, the summer showcase. They took our credentials and, oh. you know, they're hopeful. And yeah. so there are a couple of draft eligible guys that would be in that. Um, but yeah, there was a lot of games missed, no playoffs, but they did. A lot of these players played in the playoffs the year before the world juniors always counts pretty heavy. They, there is a body of work on most everybody. Sometimes if a guy's hurt though, and you don't get to see a lot of them, it does affect it. That's why I always tell people I'm not a scout, right? Cause I can't see a guy 30 times in a year. And sometimes, you know, these teams do, but some of these players, they, they didn't have a chance. I, I think a real wild card in this draft could be Dylan Holloway because as a rookie, he maybe didn't have the flash that he had in the AJHL where he's putting up all these points, you know, three years ago, they thought he had a chance to be the first overall pick, but clearly things happen. Alexei Lafreniere just broke everything open and, it was never going to be, but I have him ranked 13th, which means he really could go anywhere from 13 to 18. So, you know, you never know if he's like Angel Esposito and something happens and they look at his numbers from Wisconsin, which they were a lousy team, and they decide, yeah, he keeps slipping. You know, the Flyers could get a guy like that, and that's a guy with a better pedigree. I mean, again, when you come in as a true freshman and play center and win a lot of faceoffs in, in college hockey, that's not easy. So that's something where he right. could be a little bit of a, a little bit of a fine for a team like that. I also think um, if I'm looking, you know, Jean Luc Foudy is an interesting guy because he, you know, his brother Liam is is a really good player. He they're both physical specimens, both great skaters. They're both terrific skaters. The thing about Jean Luc Foudy is there'll be games where he tries to do too much himself, and maybe they never had the right line mates for him. Maybe. It's the way the, the offense is played on his team. Never could put my finger on it, but I saw him a couple games in a row, and he's got all the talent you would want. But there's going to have to be the right organization to unlock it because I feel like if there's not, then maybe he's a guy that just goes by the wayside and you say, wow, why, you know, how's this guy not making it with all this talent? And that could be another guy. I have him ranked 24th. So clearly the Flyers would be in the, in the running for a guy like that, and he's got good size and great speed and – you know, that's another one where I think, boy, they could um, – because you never could have enough centers. You know, everybody could say, well, we're loaded at center. Don't oh, worry boy. about that. Yeah. You, I... Plenty of guys move to wing. Some guys never play center when you think they're going to – Travis Konecti was drafted as a center, and he doesn't ever play center, right? So you don't worry about that part of it. But this draft will be interesting. There definitely are going to be fines. There's guys like, you know, Hendricks Lapierre who, you know, Flyers I think will definitely get a shot at. Uh, another center for Shikudami who, you know, did get hurt, didn't play a lot of games, but has a high offensive potential. There's going to be a lot of guys like that. There's a lot of guys in this first round. So I feel like the Flyers could definitely walk away with something good here, even if they advance in the playoffs. Like this is not a situation where I think they have to bow out the first round to get somebody really good. They're not going to get a franchise player, but I do think you can get a second or third line guy, depending on what position we're talking about, whether it's center or wing or whatnot. So, I, I do like this draft, and I do think while it may not be the best draft we've seen in years, I do think the first-round selections are going to be pretty impressive in this one. And then maybe it starts taking a hit middle of the second a little bit. And But I do think the teams that have scouted heavily overseas are the ones who are going to win in this draft because I think you're going to see a lot of Euros drafted from like the middle to late second round on and I think that's where the teams are going to win because you don't know if you've won in that game for like three or four years. I mean, you, you know, you could think about guys like I'll just give you a guy who I think could surprise like with the Rangers. His name is Tarmo Rayuanen, right? He's been overseas for three years now. Like you forget about guys like that. And then all of a sudden they come over, they come into the AHL camp. They've used to playing a men's game. Maybe they play a year in the AHL. Maybe they only play a half a year, and then all of a sudden they're playing for your team. They may not be a superstar, but that's like there's this, you know, 
talent now that you weren't even counting on. And I do think the Flyers do heavy scouting overseas. They're really good with it. And I think they could really take advantage of it this year. Oh, I love that. That gets me excited. And a name that came up in my head was Joe Valeno, uh -huh. um, who's a player who should have never been drafted that far. But, I mean, obviously just dropped and dropped. Yeah. I'm hoping the Flyers get lucky like that. Yeah, and they could. I mean, Valeno, I think the situation was everybody watched him for too long. And, and he had one bad offensive year, and then everybody's like, oh, I don't know about Joe Valeno anymore. And I think Detroit's going to make out on that deal. Yeah, I think so, too. Chris, what do you, what do you think, man? Uh, I mean, honestly, I, I would love to see them Flyers try to get Jake Neighbors. Um, he's well, he's one of my uh, favorite prospects from this draft. I think, realistically, with the way uh, that the Flyers are supposed to pick, it's around like 26, right, the Flyers are drafting? Something along, along well, those we lines. Don't know. Hopefully yeah. dead last. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. You would want be him nice. to be in the thirties, but you don't know. Yeah, right. Um, I and, and it's funny. Like as I thought about that, um, that that was brought up before that they're supposed to pick like around like twenty six or something like that because I think they said it was uh, the points percentage of the way that the uh, the season was. But um, personally, I would love uh, neighbors. I think he has a great shot. Um, I think he's good. He's really good on the power play. Another one will be Jan Misak. Uh I know Jan Misak. Uh, Misak, sorry. That's okay. Um, he, uh, I, I honestly, I feel like he, he could drop, but he could also go like really high. Um, so hopefully the Flyers could definitely try to pick something, but realistically, I think any player they take is going to be good. Um, and re re really, uh, I honestly don't, I, to me, it doesn't really matter who they take in the first round. Um, as long as it's a forward, I think that's the biggest thing. Um, I, I would love a forward and I think that's probably the most needed, uh, thing for them right now. Yeah, Misak did miss games. I don't know if he'll drop that far, like if he'll get into the 20s. I have him at 15. I think by 20, he'd probably be gone. So, but yeah, Misak would be a hell of a player if they could get him. Yeah, that just seems like every year, though, somebody too good to fall just keeps falling. I mean, like, Travis Konechny shouldn't have fallen so low. I think that's a, a clear, clear cut. Yeah, I think they were mistake. worried about him being small and reckless, and yeah. I think that's really all that really yeah. came to be. I mean, the there's a, there's a ton, like you were saying, there's a ton of great players. Getting drafted at 24 is not an insult. No. You know what I mean? Exactly. These are great players. But I do want to build off what, what Chris said because sure. I don't think you should always think that, hey, we need more forwards in the system, so let's draft forward. Especially when you're drafting as low as the Flyers may be drafting. That's a lot of times you should go with the best player on the board because we're talking three to five years before you're going to see this player. And, and I'll give you one that, this one takes a little detective work, but Ryan O'Rourke, who played for Sault Ste. Marie, I got to see him in the top prospects game. Now, it's funny, Yuri, if you said, hey, this season did get cut short, and it did. But sometimes, like when you're in the prospect game and you're busy in the early part of the year, you feel like you have all year, you can go see the playoffs, and you didn't. And luckily, Shane Malloy called me one day and said, hey, let's go on a road trip. And I, I've got it mapped out. We can catch, like, four or five games. We can catch the top prospects game, and we could, you know, see the All-American prospects game for the U.S., and I was definitely going to go see that and maybe one other game. So now this put me, you know, on the road for a week, and it was a good thing it did because we saw all these games. There was a tremendous snowstorm, and then we got past all that because we were driving to Windsor, and, and, and it was just, like, really bad, heavy Canadian okay. snow. And, and then, imagine. you know, little we know, you know, a month and a half, two months later, there's no more season, right? And so I was lucky, but with O'Rourke, I got to see him in the top prospects, and he was playing a defensive role, and I had a feeling he was – and, and didn't have a lot of points on the season, but he was really good, really good with the assignment, really physical. And when I spoke to him, I said, is that really your game or, or, or can you be an offensive defenseman? And he goes, really, honestly, I've always been an offensive defenseman. This is just a role they have me in this year. And so they did put me in for this game. And then I also spoke to um, Cole Perfetti and Perfetti had played um, midget hockey with him. And he said he was the best offensive defenseman we had. And so there's always a guy like that that ends up playing a role that sometimes slips to that point. And, you know, people are going to say, well, why are you drafting that guy? He only had like 20 points and then ends up getting a different role when they get to the NHL, especially when they're a little stronger. He could be a guy like that. And so, you know, I wouldn't say you shouldn't get a guy like that if he's the best player on the board, because end of the day, you can never have enough defense in this league. You could think you have it all figured out and a couple of injuries later, you know, you never know about those things and all of a sudden you need guys i totally agree and then you know 
I mean, if you have to make some trades potentially yeah, as right. well. Yeah, right. Trades right? is another thing. It makes it, it, other players easier, easier to move. Now, it's interesting. I'm actually looking at uh, O'Rourke's. Is it O'Rourke? Yeah, yeah O'Rourke. O'Rourke's uh, numbers over here. He did. I mean, he his first year, uh, eight goals, 14 assists, right? 22 points in 62 games. Next year, he's essentially doubling it. 54 games, seven goals, 30 assists. I mean, I think that's pretty impressive. But they're not jump. gaudy junior numbers. You know, they're not. Correct. But and that's I, what I'm getting at. But he does have it. That's my point. Well, I, I, I was actually just so I do these player profile videos, and I actually am finishing them up. Um, I'm doing Matt Niskanen, Giroux, and Faraby next. But Niskanen, um, if you go through his career, I mean, he almost has never had a flashy season. Right. You know, not not at ever at any point. In fact, his best numbers are one year with the pe- uh, Pens and now with the Flyers, actually, right. and then at the end there with the Caps. So. There are some players who are never going to see those fl- flashy numbers from them ever, but they're going to do what they do, that role, right, yeah. at every level and do it really well. Yeah, and O'Rourke's going to be that guy. Yeah, I think – and that's the type of guy you try to take maybe in the second round, end of the first. Guys who you know will be good players, maybe they yeah. won't be star players, but they'll help you win a championship in some capacity. Yeah, and he's really physical. Like he, he bangs guys, so when he gets stronger, that's another thing where – Look, I'm sure the Flyers have him on the radar. I'm sure they do. I love that. I love that. And we actually, we interviewed uh, Ruben Rafkin as well. Um, and I think that's another guy. He's a little smaller, but he's mm-hmm. right-handed defenseman. Um, he's got a really good game. He's going to play in Europe, like you said. Um, so it was really interesting talking to him. I could see them taking an interest in him as well. If you want to see an interesting guy, another interesting guy is Ty Tulio. Um, I did write about him uh, recently. And... He is in my, if he's not in my latest, he'll be in my next rankings. But Tulio had a, a fair amount of points. He's not the biggest guy, but he is another guy that I think just isn't like on the radar for everybody. Yeah. But if you look at second, third round picks, and I've done this before, you just go through draft histories, you will find some of the best defensemen in of all time and in the league right yeah. in that window of second to third round picks. Um, those guys who just might not have it all, but then figure it out a little later and then become elite guys. I've seen a lot of that. Um, Duncan Keith, we were talking about him. He's one of those guys who kind of elevated yeah, Tul- his game. Tulio probably goes in the second round, but he um, he had 15 goals and 42 points and yeah. played for Oshawa. Actually, uh, sorry, that was the year before. He had 27 goals, 66 points in 62 games this year. That's really good. That's a really good year. But again, a good. lot of guys have numbers like that. and. Right. And so that's something where, you know, if you're the Flyers and you, you're in the second round, he's still around, maybe you want to move up or something to get a guy like that. That's the kind of guy that could really do something down the road because there's a lot of character with him. I interviewed um, his line mate was Philip Tomasino from Nashville, who's a hell of a player. I think, boy, I, I don't even know if he gets fully the credit he he should for being an offensive player. But he already talked about how Tulio was terrific with him. And it wasn't like he had to set him up for everything. It was it was a two way street. So you know that's another guy where you could look for a guy like that in the second round. Tyce Milanic is a, a center for the U.S. team. You could look for in the second round. His blazing speed could play center or wing. Those kinds of guys. The second round in this year, the first fifteen or twenty picks in the second round are going to be really good too. Interesting. That's interesting. We'll look out for that in the draft. Chris, yeah. any any players you want to talk about before we sign off here? Uh, honestly, no, not really. I mean, I'm not like too heavy on this draft. I mean, I know some guys, um, but Russ, I wanted to ask you, um, what do you think about, uh, Pavel Novak? I haven't seen much of Novak. I'll be honest. So I don't have, no. no. Yeah. He's, uh, he's on Kelowna. I'm not sure if you know the Rockets. Um, he, I've seen a little bit of him. Um, he's a very good shot. That's one thing I will say. Um, it looks pretty decent on the power play, um, but to be honest, um, I'm 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 very excited about this draft. Uh, but um, I think that's I think that's I think that's about it. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, Russ, any other players you want to mention before we sign off? Here? I want to mention. I like um, to leave it. You know, if you have any, yeah, go ahead. Here, here's what I'm going to mention. Chris won't know this player. Um, but it was funny because I, I rode the elevator with him at the draft. Nick Riapel was a, uh, a Flyers goalie back in the day, yes. and, and, he, and he played a little bit. And you know what? I always say that 
You can never have enough goalies. So even in this draft, even though they're loaded in their system, you should always take a goalie every year. And so this year, though, it isn't loaded. So if you're going to take one, you probably take it by the fifth round. And But I still would do it because, again, you don't know – What's going to happen with a lot of these guys? You can see Sanderson has fallen behind a little bit from from the pack. And even though Ustamenko is now the flavor of the month for everybody's favorite right. prospect goalie, uh, I think Ursan, Sam Ursan's better than them all. Right. But you don't get to see him all the time. Right. So, you know, I think they should always go and take a goalie. But I don't have a recommendation for that one because that that's tough. Um, I know the U.S. kid, Drew Comesso, who's the – Number one ranked uh, North American goalie is good. I don't know if he's great, but again, you know, sometimes you draft in a backup too. And so, you know, if he's around, maybe they go after him, but I don't know if he'll be around. You know, after you get past Askarov, there's um, the other Canadian kid too. Uh, oh, I forget. He played for in the World Juniors, but there's him. And, and then there's Comesso. And so, you know, I still wouldn't shy away from getting another goalie because all these goalies take three to five years. You're going you're gonna to probably – you could lose a goalie in the expansion draft. You never know. Actually, I don't think they're set up to lose one in this expansion draft. They'll probably, they'll probably lose a defenseman in this one. But still, you never know. You never know if a goalie gets hurt. It all happens. Um yeah, I'm not sure who the other goalie is. That's going to bug me now. I'm, I'm, right. like, I'm trying to pull up elite prospects here on the side here. Yeah, I write for them too. So. Yeah. Oh, you do? I do. I didn't know that. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nico Dawes, right? Oh, you're a little far from your mic there, Chris. What are you saying? Is it Nico Dawes? Oh, it's hard to hear him now. Times. I couldn't really. Yeah, your volume went down for some reason. Did it? Yeah. Whatever. All right, well, I honestly, well, we can. Look up that goalie real quick here. I do want to look that up before we go. I know. I'm trying to look it up, too. Hold on. I think I have it. Uh, let's see. Austin? I don't see any rankings here. I just, I just texted it to you. I don't know if you saw it. To who? To me? Yeah, to you. I don't know. Oh, Nico Dawes? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He's, he's a pretty good goalie. He'll be the second one that goes off. Uh, they won't get a shot at him. But you never know, like guy like Comesso, there's sometimes goalies don't get drafted. But yeah, Nico Dawes will probably be the second goalie that gets drafted. Askarov will go, I think, in the top 10 picks. So, and because he's special and, and somebody's going to need a uh, a franchise goalie like that. But yeah, thank you. At least you, <laughs> you solved that for me because every once in a while there's a name, you forget it, and it's like, oh. Well, I mean, every year. How many how many players you're looking at every year? It's impossible to keep up with it. All right, I think we're gonna cut it out here at the end. We're at we're at the hour. Um, Chris, thanks thank you so much for joining, buddy. I really appreciate you. And Russ, thank you, thank you for being a guest. Thank you for sharing the knowledge. I was actually super excited. I think really timely episode to have you on just as we're kind of getting in all these players. Yeah, Jamie missed out, but whatever. It's his yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, you snooze, you lose, Jamie. Uh, we'll have to uh, we'll, we'll set another one up for the future. But uh, one more time, please tell people where to follow you and uh, you know where they can find your work. Yeah, at Sportsology, Elite Prospects. Uh, if you go to Amazon.com, I've written nine books. Working on a tenth. One of them is a Flyers book. <clears throat> I rotate between baseball and hockey generally. But those are the two sites. There's also a site called Featured, which they aggregate, so they send out to a bunch of different sites. So sometimes my work ends up in in different places from them too but elite prospect sportsology at sportsology for you know twitter and instagram and russ cohen on uh facebook awesome awesome chris you want to tell people where to follow you before we head out yeah uh twitter it's a uh, flyer Semania. uh instagram is just flyer Semania 93 because i couldn't have the 93 to the twitter name uh and then on youtube as well as flyer Semania 93 with a bunch of flyer stuff uh daily all right Thank you, thank you, thank you to all the readers and listeners. Appreciate you listening every time, and we love you all. Thank you so much for the support. Remember to always stay gritty.